Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event. We would like to start this evening with a land acknowledgement of the traditional territory in which we are gathering. Our university campus is situated on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas, a branch of the Greater Anishinaabe Nation, which includes Algonquin, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. Because everyone is tuning in with us remotely across a variety of cities, and we don't want to forgo this important element of reconciliation, I would like to ask everyone to take a moment to acknowledge that the land they are on is the traditional territory of many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. As a university community, we are dedicated to continue to increase our awareness, understanding, and gratitude for the lands we share. Thank you. My name is Carolyn Howard, and I am the Alumni Relations Coordinator at Ontario Tech. On the behalf of the Alumni Association Council and the Ontario Tech Ridgebacks, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's Alumni Speaker Series, Athletes to Educators. We are pleased to have Fabio Campoli, Kayla D'Souza, and Alison Ng with us this evening to talk about their experiences at Ontario Tech and where life has taken them since graduation. The Alumni Association Council is constantly trying to think of ways to engage fellow alumni, and if there's a silver lining out there in this difficult time, it's that we've been able to move our events online, meaning alumni anywhere in the world can participate. I'd like to thank everyone who submitted questions with registration. They helped direct this evening's conversation. Uh, you do still have the opportunity to submit questions in the moderated Q&A found at the bottom of your screen. Um, we are also opening up the chat function this evening, so feel free to say hello and drop your comments in there. I would now like to introduce our moderator, Marissa Murphy, and together we will introduce our speakers for this evening. Marissa is a current student athlete on the Ridgeback women's hockey team from Odessa, Ontario. She just completed her Bachelor of Commerce and has been accepted into the sorry, Bachelor of Education at Ontario Tech beginning in September. One of her Ridgeback highlights was playing against Queens in her hometown, during which she played one of the best games of her career in front of her family and friends, both scoring a goal and getting an assist. Welcome, Marissa. Thank you, Carolyn. I'm so excited to be moderating the panel this evening. Um, so we're going to start introducing our amazing speakers. So Alison Ng attended Ontario Tech from 2007 to 2013. She joined Ontario Tech's concurrent education program, graduating with a degree in applied and industrial mathematics, and was automatically enrolled into Ontario Tech's teacher college. Um, at the end of her second year, she decided to change her major from a chemistry degree to math, which resulted in an extra year for her undergrad. Throughout her six years of school, she rowed for the Ridgebacks women's rowing team, participating in the women's eight, four plus and doubles. Um, her boats qualified for OUA finals and she had the opportunity to row at the national level during her fifth year of rowing. Every year, Allison and her fiance, who is also an Ontario Tech grad and rowing alumnus, join Ontario Tech's rowing team at the heat of the Trent to participate in Ontario Tech's alumni boat. They are always joined by the Rhodesian Bridgebacks, Lexi and Logan, and previously Henley, who act as mascots for the day. For the last seven years, Allison has been working for the Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board and finally gained a permanent teaching position this past year. She teaches at Bowmanville High School, where she is currently teaches girls physical education. She has qualifications in senior mathematics and chemistry, as well as special education, guidance, and cooperative education. So welcome to Allison. All right. During her time at Ontario Tech, Kayla D'Souza co-captained the women's soccer team, gaining Rookie of the Year honors in 2014, along with leadership in all academic awards in 2015. She graduated in 2015, with a Bachelor of Education specializing in full day kindergarten, primary and junior. After graduating, Kayla took History AQ, which allows her to teach intermediate grades seven and eight, along with grade nine and 10 in history. Kayla was initially hired in 2016 as library technician at the Toronto Catholic School Board. She began working as a supply teacher in 2017, allowing her to simultaneously coach competitive soccer and work with a family construction business. Kayla has a five-year-old German Shepherd mix named Chico. She plays internationally for the Guyana women's national team along with coaching the U20 women's national team. In September, Kayla will be getting married along with heading back to school for interior design, which will provide her with new options to teach at a college and university level in the future. Welcome Kayla. And Marissa, just on mute, there we go. There we go. So um, Fabio Campoli was the first men's soccer player to be named an OUA first team all-star. Um, throughout the course of his career, he went on to be named the 2017 soccer MVP, offensive player of the year twice, and 2016 Ontario Tech men's athlete of the year. 
After graduating from Ontario Tech, he pursued his ABQ for special education and AQ for immediate, intermediate history. He was hired by the York District School Board and is currently an SK grade one teacher at Wiltshire Elementary School. And a little fun fact, he has a three-year-old miniature pincher named Lupo, and he has a Canada Soccer National B license and is um, the Bolton Soccer Club technical director. His younger brother, Chris, has continued the family legacy at Ontario Tech, and the sophomore, he plays midfielder for the men's soccer team and wears Fabio's number 10 jersey. So welcome, Fabio. Okay, so I believe we're starting with a question kind of for all of you. Um, so what drew you to your specialty and why, and what do you think makes you successful in your specialty? So we can start with Allison if we want. Um, so do you mean like, uh, like teachables wise? Yeah, yeah, you're teachable, yeah. Yeah, so when I was in um, uh, in high school, I always sort of wanted to be a teacher um, just because I had such a fantastic experience when I was in high school. And initially I actually wanted to be a phys ed teacher and uh, my teachers were very much kind of aware of what I, my, um, where I was like really su easily successful. And they were like, you know what? You do really well in science and you do really well in math. And that's where we need teachers right now. Um, so they ended up steering me in towards math and sciences. Um, but uh, from the get-go, I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. Um, just, I was lucky enough that math came natural to me, naturally to me. And so that, um, and then I just had a fantastic chemistry teacher when I was in high school and he really kind of drew me towards just the, the, um, experience of discovery and being able to just test new things and try new things. And it really made it very much enjoyable. And so that's what pushed me towards education. And why it came to you uh, to Ontario Tech because it had a um, teaching program there, um, and it just have always loved it, and I still love teaching it today. And and I occasionally teach um, chemistry and math. Right now, I'm teaching phys ed, which I lucked out, but uh, I do teach uh, sciences and math normally. Awesome, Kayla. Yeah. So I mean, originally I wanted to teach high school um, and specialize in physical education, history, and visual arts. Um, those were things that I was always interested in high school. Um, and a lot of that what is what I carried into my uh, university. However, I didn't have all the prerequisites to become a high school teacher uh, as I was applying for teacher's college. So I, that's how I ended up with FDK um, primary junior. But I think it was easy for me to go that route because I had started off my coaching career uh, with young kids. So it was an easy transition because coaching and teaching has a lot of similarities, um, just different content that you're, that you're giving the kids. And then, and I think pretty much for me where I'm at, no matter what age I'm really teaching, um, I think what makes me the most successful is the relationships that I have and connecting with students, not just with the material, but outside of the material. Because when you think about it, um, kids and people in general learn from um, individuals that they like or that they like being around. Just imagine yourself having a boss. You're going to connect better with a boss that you like and learn from them uh, versus somebody that you don't get along with. Um, so I, I, I make sure to have that relationship and connection with my students um, or any youth that I'm really mentoring. And that's pretty much what makes me successful. Awesome. And Fabio? I think Kayla said all my ideas, um, basically with coaching too. I think it was an easier transition. Um, what got me into teaching was being an older brother to two siblings that were 14 and nine years apart from myself. So I kind of had to play that teacher role from the really beginning with my brothers. And uh, I started coaching when I was 19 and I started coaching five-year-olds. So I guess I kind of prepared my patience from, from the start. And um, just like Kayla, the transition from coaching to teaching was kind of seamless and um, What's really made me successful has been building personal relationships with most of my students rather than just treating the classroom as a whole group. Again, people like Kayla said, like to learn from people they like. So bringing people's interest and your love for things that they like to do into the classroom is a really important thing for me, especially keeping the attention of SKs and grade ones all day. I think you have to kind of give them something that they can relate to at that young age. And I think that's what makes me successful right now. And having those 
past experiences with coaching has also really helped. Awesome. Okay, now this one's going to be directed towards Allison. So I know you talked about all of your STEM qualifications that you have and stuff um, and kind of what drew you to pursue STEM as well. Um, are you currently teaching any math or chemistry classes? I don't. Um, so I'm, I taught science last We right now because of virtual high school, we're in a quad master schedule. So um, over the past in September, I've already taught science twice. Um, I've just kind of been tossed into many different subjects at the high school level just because um, you just have to be adaptable, right? And so yeah. I have been teaching um, a bit of science, chemistry I taught last year. Um, it's, it's something that I am passionate about. I love um, showing kids just the wonders of science and just trying to teach them critical thinking when it comes to seeing things in the media even, right? When we talk about things like climate change and we talk about things um, with respect to vaccinations and everything that was happening right now with this pandemic, um, I find that our students really appreciated uh, learning about the science behind um, why we were having to quarantine, science behind why it's important to vaccinate. Um, so it was, it was a great opportunity to kind of teach some of the current events into um, all of our science and technology related um, understanding because it just showed kids how important it is in, in their everyday lives. Awesome. And specifically, I think... I know you talked about like how your teachers um, kind of motivated you to go into STEM, but how do you foster involvement in STEM with your female students specifically? Um, so just even being there present as a teacher, right? Um, there's so much to say about representation when you are able to be in a classroom and see someone that could potentially look like you or someone that could be a role model to you. So. Um, I really try to encourage kids, uh, my students to see like how science can impact every part of their life and how it's important to um, try to understand deeper and really think critically about the things that they see on the internet, on television. Um, for a lot of my female students, um, they love to learn sort of, I try to gear them towards the science behind just the things that they're interested in, in making those connections. <laughs> and I'm gonna have a bark, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they, <laughs> Sorry about that. My uh, my students really enjoy it. Nice. Sorry, neighbors came home. That's <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they. I think both my male and female students they just love to make the connections in their everyday life, and that mm -hmm. just draws them further into STEM related uh, topics. Nice. Okay, so the next one we're gonna direct is towards Fabio. Um, I know you're right now SK grade one, but what do you think is the most underrated uh, skill that a kindergarten teacher can possess? I think the most underrated skill for an SK one teacher or any teacher that's kind of working FDK is uh, flexibility and adaptation, right? <laughs> a lot of, you know, plans during the day might not work the exact way you want them to. So I think adapting and being flexible and Differentiated instruction, I think, is huge too because not everyone learns the same way, right? Especially when you're dealing with students that are so young. I think making multiple ways to come to an answer is, I think, one of the most underrated skills. I like to ask a lot of open ended questions because with younger students, it's very easy to turn them off from participating and making them confident. I think building confidence at an early age is so crucial for overall success of students in their long range plans. So asking a lot of open ended questions, being flexible, adapting, things will always happen in a classroom, especially in SK one, you'd be surprised at how many little delays throughout the day because you know, someone forgot their snack at home. So that's a tier session for about 20 minutes. So, you know, there's, there's so many different tugs and pulls of the shirt in different ways. So I think being flexible, being adaptive and differentiated instruction, I think is the most crucial to be honest just showing painting the same picture multiple different ways for people to have a look is I think the most underrated skill. Interesting. Okay, and then Kayla, we're gonna put you in the spotlight now as a history teacher, do you ever think about what it might like to be to teach like this period of history? So especially with like COVID and stuff in the future. So like say 20 years from now teaching students about this period of time. Yeah, so I mean, I'm not actually in the position to be teaching history just yet, because as a supply, I'm just kind of covering whatever it is that is being presented to me by the teacher. Mm -hmm. um, but I think 
you know, like with anything in history, it's a good lesson, um, regardless of what period in time that you're looking at. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's just, it's hard, it's funny that, you know, we're in history, we're, we're in, you know, living history that we're going to have to look back on, you know, whether it's in five years, 10 years, or, you know, when we're old people and it's, you know, it's in a, the new textbook that comes out. Um, but I think it's, um, I think it'll be interesting conversation to have, especially, you know, having to teach uh, a new generation who haven't actually had to experience living through COVID and you being somebody as an educator who has lived through that, um, I think will be interesting to see how that comes out in curriculum and, and how the, those topics um, are discussed. But, you know, even just now, um, the conversations that I have on a daily basis with the kids that I coach um, or the kids that I supply and it's, you know, when can we go back to normal again? And I, and I find that a lot of them, um, even at such a young age, really appreciate, um, you know, where we were a year ago. Um, and, you know, you always have the one kid that complains or doesn't like school and, you know, they actually miss school and they miss being in the classroom and they miss seeing their friends and they miss having that social interaction. Um, so I think it's also been just a great lesson for current students right now and, and, and how, how we appreciate, you know, once something's taken away from you and how much you miss it when it's gone, so. Very true. I'm not really minding online school personally, because normally I'd have to like go to the rink in the morning and then like go back and shower quickly and then run to class and now I can like shower and like eat breakfast and like lie in bed and watch my, <laughs> uh, but all of mine, I believe next year for my first year teacher's college are on, um, I think they're all in person except for one. So now it's gonna be okay, now you have to shower and you have to go downtown now instead. Um, okay, back to Fabio, You were you a factor? Cause your brother's at Ontario Tech or um, was, or he is still? Still is. Still is, yep. Um, what was a factor? Were you a factor in his decision to come to Ontario Tech and him taking your number was that? planned was that just a coincidence what was the story behind that um i definitely definitely influenced my brother to go to ontario tech just because of all the positive experiences i had um i see there's a lot of actual men's soccer players in the in the uh, attendees i see uh jordan i see no i see mateo players i played with and i think that was just shows you the family orientated you know situation i was in with UIT, I always felt like it was just a big family and I loved the smaller class sizes. I enjoyed the closeness of the relationships built through either soccer or academics. Um, my professors at UIT, sorry, Ontario Tech now, <laughs> um, were always, you know, treated you more than just a number, just a person. They always built that bond with you and you could always reach them at any time. And I thought that was huge. Coming from another university, I did my undergrad at York U, where I found things were totally different. It was a bigger university at the time, um, you know, bigger lecture halls. This was more close knit. I really enjoyed it. And I thought that Ontario Tech really prepared my cohort of teachers to be really 21st century learners and teachers at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, the use of technology was huge. And I thought that going forward, that's that was one of the main decisions why I also came to Ontario Tech was the technology factor, especially moving forward as a teacher. Um, did what was the second part of the question with my brother? The number, the number, number 10. Oh, he knows. He knew that was my number. <laughs> he knew. Uh, we were very competitive at home. So we constantly have the debate on who the better number 10 is, right? I think he knows the answer, but <laughs> I'll say it on the record. I was definitely. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, he knows that I think my experience is I always try and kind of guide him to be a better version of me, all kidding aside, you know, I, I've known the experiences. It's that first year of playing in the OUA is a transition. It doesn't really matter what league you played in before. There's always that transition period. And I told Chris, just, you know, dive in, enjoy yourself, have fun. Um, I knew he was going to be in great hands with the coaching staff, um, Ramin. Is, is an excellent coach and still a close friend of mine. And um, obviously the teammates are incredible there and the leadership group there with Mateo, players like Jordan, I think now they're in fourth year, Jordan Mello, um, 
and the group of players that I saw him go in with, I know there's a few others on here too, like Matt and a couple other players were going to be good players for him. And they were super successful in their first year. And I couldn't be happier for the program and how it's grown. I just wish I was able to play on the turf field, but you know, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Um, also, just a reminder for the um, attendees that there's a Q&A box there. So if you have any questions, I know that we have three so far, but if there's anyone else with um, questions, feel free to put them in and we'll address them at the end. Um, we're going to go back to picking on Kayla. I know we mentioned earlier that you played for the Guyana national team. Kind of walk us through that. Like, how did that end up? happening like what was your experience like there um yeah I mean at the time I wasn't playing soccer um anymore I fortunately quit at a at the age of 17 which I regret and kick myself now um and I was approached when I was 19 um by some other Toronto-based um Guyanese players um who were presented with this experience so I didn't, I couldn't say no, like playing at a national team level, um, that kind of sparked my love back for the game and just the people that I was able to meet. Um, and it's a national team like no other, um, it's not the most, uh, the, the most wealthiest country with sport. Um, so I think the impact there, um, makes it that much more meaningful. Um, yeah, so I mean, starting up and being a part of the uh, first ever women's team and being so successful, Olympic qualifiers, World Cup qualifying, you know, making history at such a young age um, and playing against world class players like Christine Sinclair, um, Canadian national team was an un unbelievable experience um, and always making it to the top eight is something I'll never forget. Um, and it kind of brought me back into sport, um, got me pumped about coaching. And even though I'm old but and after and two knee surgeries uh hopefully going to give it one more run but um i've been uh, i was offered the opportunity to also give back and coach uh, at the u20 level um just before the pandemic happened and the whole shutdown um and we did exceptionally well um in that tournament with the u20s so again feeding into my teaching and my coaching i was able to do that um and again for a bigger purpose for a country that needs it um so, I mean, it's priceless experience and I just wish I could press pause on time and stay here forever um, and play and coach. <laughs> That's amazing. All right, Allison, we're back to you. It's been a sec, hope you're ready. Um, okay, so I know we mentioned that you compete with the alumni boat every year and you bring your dogs and stuff. Um, what are the biggest differences between rowing like when you're a student athlete and then rowing in the, sorry, that's the cats. Um, and then rowing in um, the alumni boat. Um, so one of the major things was just the conditioning when we were in university, we were up at 4.30 in the morning, getting into our cars to be on the lake for 5 a.m. or for uh, 6 a.m. It was, um, you were much more regimented in your conditioning and making sure that you were staying active, working out. Um, as an alumni, all of us, whenever we get back into that alumni boat for the one race of the year, that is not necessarily, weren't really in it for the best time. We were more so in it for just a good time, right? And so um, we were all just at different varying levels of athleticism. Um, with the last time, oftentimes we were in a boat was the year before that we were in alumni boat. So it's just more about the camaraderie and being able to just get back together with your teammates as if no time has, has gone by. And it's just always amazing to see the new athletes that come up every year and just to see sort of the team aspect that they've built um, when they were together. Um, rowing is one of those uh, team sports where it's very much like a family because you have no choice but to be family when you're uh, with each other at six o'clock in the morning out in the middle of a freezing cold lake and you get to know each other very well and so it's amazing just to be able to keep in contact with your old teammates and catch up with them and it just brings this opportunity to get together um, every year to to just catch up with life um, so that's why I just love that head of the trend is kind of something that we are able to get together to to keep going back to and, and enjoying um, and I'm glad that Trent's willing to let us have our alumni boats in the races as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. 
All right, so now we're going to dive into probably the most talked about topic in the past year and a half, COVID. Um, so we're all kind of aware of how it's obviously impacted teachers, students, and just like the whole schooling system in general. Um, do you think, are there any practices that you'll continue to implement after the pandemic ends? So Fabio, let's start with you. So as someone dealing with like the youngest students, um, obviously I know you've mentioned that it can be difficult to even not thinking about COVID, just about you said, um, the uncertainty of everything. Um, is there anything that you will continue to be doing um, after the pandemic ends that you started during COVID? Yeah, I think um, the inclusion of Google Classroom, I think is something that I don't think any teachers ever use more of this year than ever before. I think having that open dialogue with parents and, and students virtually. So if they do miss a day, if they are absent, I remember when I went to school, we used to always have to call a friend and say, hey, what did I miss? Or did the teacher give you my homework folder? Can you can I meet up with you and pick it up? I think now Google Classroom has just made things so much easier and the, the ability to just scan in a PDF and have the person you know view it at home and just the, communi the open communication with parents and families that I've kind of been able to do this year with especially younger students on Google Classroom has been a game changer. Um, I think another practice that maybe I will continue to um, incorporate is being able to, the use of technology, right? I think before really wasn't implemented as much as this year, you know, showing videos of actual real world events that are happening throughout our world, having that that technology tool has really aided teaching this year. And I think, I can't speak for Kayla or Allison, but I think videos have been a really, a, a big hand in teaching and showing, especially when we're not face-to-face -face and we can't do a lot of hands-on activity. I think showing has really replaced doing this year. And I think obviously that's a downfall for being online, especially with the younger grades where a lot of it is hands-on. I know, you know, the SK one, the SKs and JKs is a lot of play-based learning. So you're really taking away the play <laughs> from play-based if they're not able to really use their hands and go through their day-to-day -day, um, inquiry and observation stages. So I think just showing is gonna continue with a lot of videos and the use of Google Classroom and technology. So it, it only enhances teaching, I think, technology, and it's the way that things are going anyways these days, so. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and then I kind of gonna ask the same question to Allison. So you're teaching PE this quadmester. Um, has doing PE like specifically online, has it provided you with any like key learnings? Yeah, so um, I've had an opportunity basically to scour the internet for all sorts of different videos and ways in which um, I can show students that you don't need a teacher to tell you what to do, that you can easily find, act, you can access all these different um, options that will work best for you and to work best for their capabilities, for their um, activity level. Um, uh, but like Fabio said, like just that being able to show kids um, all of the uh, the access to information at their fingertips, right? The internet is this vast place where they can find so much information. And um, I just have students that saw all these different varying levels that um, it's been wonderful to have them uh, respond back and say that they've been loving the workouts, but I've been doing live workouts with them. Um, and also I find that with teaching phys ed um, virtually, because I can't do the sport specific training and um, being able to, to get them to learn how to dribble a ball or to shoot um, shoot a hoop because they might not have access to a basketball net at home. So instead, we really um, pivoted our PE to personal fitness and just um, gearing it towards things that they have access to at home, but also doing a lot of um, mental health um, talks about mental health. Um, every day we do a wellness journal just to talk about um, what are things that bring them joy? What are things that, where do they feel the safest? Just because there's just so much uncertainty with with COVID and we just don't know what's happening next. And I know that a lot of my students have appreciated just that mindfulness and, and we're really going, uh, pushing more um, mental health awareness because you know what, it's, it's become a big thing with all of these lockdowns and this isolation. Awesome. And then um, Kayla, we're picking on you last. So as a supply teacher during the pandemic, uh, you've probably, I'm assuming have had to be extremely flexible. 
Um, if you could kind of talk to all other supply teachers or a new incoming supply teacher that has to supply during the pandemic, um, what would be your best tip for them? Um, so the online piece as a supply, um, it's not something that you really have access to. Um, so if a teacher is not there, there's just no class for the day. Um, but for the weeks that we were in school and we were in class, um, you know, just being prepared um, and just really knowing the safety protocol that goes in hand in hand with COVID. Um, you know, our board has our checking passports and, you know, making sure that, you know, the sanitization process and just being in every, a different room every day. Um, every teacher has their own routine and just making sure you stick to that routine and it just makes your day a lot more seamless. Um, you know, at least in the school that I'm, I'm mainly at, they have their little these folder boards that um, <laughs> create like a little shield. Um, so just making sure again, that you just stick to the rules and regulations because um, every teacher has their own little quirks. You know, some people can take it down when you're looking at an overhead or, or whatever it might be. Um, so just being really, really um, up, getting up to speed onto what their health protocol is in their classroom um, is definitely a tip. Um, and, you know, at least I can speak for my own board is just being ready to go at any school at any point because they're in such need for supply teachers. Um, so I am super busy um, and just all over the place. So just being um, ready to adapt um, in, in whatever scenario that you're in, so. Awesome, okay, so um, I think we're gonna head over to the Q&A now. Um, Okay, awesome. We have six ones. Um, let's start with Susan has a question here um, for everybody. So we'll just kind of, uh, everyone can get a chance to touch on this. So what skills or attributes did your experience as a varsity athlete instill in you? And how do you think that these um, skills have helped you as a teacher? So um, whoever has an answer, just unmute yourself. I think playing, I'll answer this one. I think playing a team sport teaches you collaboration skills, regardless of what team sport you play. And I think as teachers, we always collaborate with our teaching partners and, you know, students, families, admin. So being, you know, someone that's able to get along with others and collaborate on different ideas and come together and face sometimes struggles as a group, I think that really prepares you as a student athlete, for sure. Um, as part of, you know, just, the cohesiveness of a unit, you know, different personalities, different dealing with different people every day has really prepared me for, for real world experiences in the teaching world. And that's probably one of the major things that I've gotten from being a student athlete and being flexible. Um, just like you said, uh, Marissa, that, you know, you wake up in the morning, you quickly run to class, you quickly do your thing, shower, come back. It's constantly on the go. And I think those situations really teach you a sense of commitment to your to your trade and to your sport. And it's the same with teaching, right? I coached a basketball team last year for my school and we had practice at 7 a.m., right? So it's being flexible and being able to, to give, I think is a very important thing when you're a teacher. It's, you know, making experiences for, for students that they won't forget. No offense to Allison or anybody, but you know, some students will forget the math lesson during the day, but I don't think they'll ever forget how you made them feel or what, you know, championships they've won at school or the experiences that have, you know, either changed their outlook on learning or changed their outlook on their friends. And I think those little things are just as important as, as teaching the academic side. I also find with um, athletics as well, um, just as a student athlete, you have to adapt to change um, and be willing to deal with change no matter what you, it's out of your control, right? So as an athlete waking up in the morning and having to practice in the rain or having to deal with frigid cool temperatures, or even when for rowing, we would have a race and it would be so windy that we were worried about our boat tipping, but you just had to learn to adapt. And that's the same thing with teaching. Every day, you don't know what you're walking into with your classrooms. If your kid is on an off day and you just have to accept the fact that you're probably not going to get to everything that you need to teach that day because you just need to deal with their mental health and, and what is going on in their day and, and just use it as a teachable lesson to, like Fabio said, deal with the student rather than the curriculum side of things, right? So just, um, and also with COVID and all of this uncertainty right now, we're trying to teach kids to, to deal with change, to deal with 
um, and adapting with everything that's going on in their life and just making the best of it. Yeah, I think in addition to uh, what Allison and Fabio both said, great points. Um, I think versatility as well, just stemming from a supply teacher um, and having to work with kindergartens right up until grade 12s. Um, you know, I can speak for myself getting thrown into almost every position except for being goalie. Um, having to be able to play and perform and the same thing happens in a classroom. So when I show up to work, um, regardless of what class I get put into, I need to be ready. Um, sometimes I have to reteach myself material because if I'm now teaching a math lesson, uh, yes, I can do little shapes maybe with little guys, but then now I'm having to actually teach grade eights, um, a lesson for the day and I have to be ready uh, for that. And sometimes you find out, you know, 30 minutes before, five minutes before, um, you know, there's been days where I've been said, I've been booked to, you know, go teach grade threes. And then the principal tells me in the morning, actually, we need you in this room. And I get moved. And with my mindset, now I have to change and be versatile and adapt, you know, just playing off what Allison was saying. Um, and as a supply, in addition to all of this is being ready to deal with different personalities. Um, so as a supply, you know, a lot of teachers will say, ah, oh, that's probably so hard. Like, how do you enjoy being a supply teacher? Um, you know, people, you know, the kids like to take advantage of the supply. Um, and I tend to disagree because it's just being alert and being able to recognize the personalities that you have to deal with. Um, and again, this is just coming from the team environment. You have different players and different personalities and even just your opponent, um, sometimes in a game, which maybe is not always the most fun, um, you know, you have your, your mouthy uh, opponents in games and how do you deal with that? Um, and the same thing applies in the classroom. Um, so just being able to recognize who those personalities are and how can you connect with them um, to make the day not only a, a, a good day for you as, a, as the facilitator and the educator, but also for the class and for a positive learning environment. So I think those are just some some additional skills that at least as a supply, when you're thrown into a different environment on a daily basis, um, you really have to be versatile and be able to adapt in, in those situations. Awesome. Um, so we got a few more questions. So um, this one I'm kind of gonna direct towards Allison. Um, so Jody has asked, so she said, what updates would you like to see um, to the provincial curriculum going forward. So example, learning to code, more of an emphasis on STEM, video productions, and what are things that you might, that you feel might um, kind of be slowly phased out. So kind of the, um, the STEM portion of that, Allison, if you wanna to touch on things that you'd like um, to see added to the curriculum. Yeah, so the nice thing about the curriculum right now is that it's fairly open-ended in terms of the options, of what we can teach. We still have to kind of cover basic um, sorts like topics and subjects, especially at the secondary level, because um, for example, grade nine, just like how math kind of builds on itself as it goes through certain topics builds as it goes through. So things like, for, especially for chemistry, what we teach in the grade nine chemistry curriculum builds on itself to the grade 10, which then helps to build to the grade 11 and grade 12. Um, what we're, we've kind of geared or spun some of our topics towards um, in terms of sciences that we're starting to highlight a lot more in terms of uh, environmental. I remember when I was in high school, we, my teacher just kind of skimmed through it in a week just because they wanted to get through the other subjects. But I find that my colleagues and I are pushing a lot more um, environmental understanding and information for our kids just because it's at the forefront of what they're experiencing. Um, last year with um, all of the um, students who were protesting, um, for changes in terms of climate policy, right? And I had students that were out um, on our main street in front of our high school every Wednesday um, uh, protesting for climate change. Um, so we try to kind of, uh, I find that the curriculum started to, we're lucky enough that it's open enough that we can um, pick and choose kind of what we want to present. And we try to bring the topics that are most important to the present day um, to the forefront because it's what's uh, not only engages the students more, but it um, is really important to them a lot of the time, right? They're really engaged in it. Um, in terms of uh, coding, we're hoping to see it a lot more often. Um, I know that they're starting to introduce it into the um, elementary level. And then I think it's eventually going to domino effect up to the secondary level, but I'm not too sure like where it's going to land. 
Um, we do have computer science teachers who are specific in that area. And um, generally it is offered um, at the grade nine, they do kind of an intro to coding at my school. Um, and then whether or not they have enough students to um, be able to keep a senior level course open in terms of coding. Um, hopefully more and more kids are going to be interested in it because it's going to be introduced at the elementary level where we can offer it as, as definitely a thing at the senior level. Um, and in terms of changes to the curriculum, my hope is that they're going to kind of make it more present day awareness of kind of what's important and what's really engaging the kids, right? Um, like you said, like the question said for, for coding, um, it's something that is going to be a reality in our present day life. We're meeting virtually right now, right? And so being able to have that access to understand how the technology works, that's gonna have a huge impact on these kids in the future. And that's gonna impact kind of what jobs are available to as well. Awesome. Um, okay, so we have from an anonymous attendee. Um, they said, my kids' teachers have been rocking the online learning and I'm so grateful for them. Um, kudos to all of you. Uh, what is one thing you wish parents understood about your challenges and what is one thing that would make life a little easier for you? So I'm going to kind of direct this towards Fabio um, just because I know you have the younger kids and obviously virtual learning um, is probably a little more difficult for the younger kids than it is for the uh, the, the older kids. So um, yeah, what are some things that you wish parents would understand about the challenges and what's one thing that would uh, would make life a little easier for you as their teacher? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think something that maybe I wish parents would realize is that not everyone learns at the same pace, um, especially when you're online. It's very difficult to make things very personalized and individualized for a group because you're not able to spend that one on one time with younger students that you would in a classroom. Like, for instance, just, you know, guided reading opportunities. I used to smit, sit with small groups and read with them. Um, first week of online learning, I tried breakout rooms and students didn't know how to access them. And, you know, you have a lot of families that, you know, their parents are working, their parents are teachers and they're teaching their own class and can't sit with a five-year-old all day. So you have to really keep things as user-friendly as possible. Um, I think just, you know, making it the bigger picture about us rather than me, I think is a big, um, Thing that I wish some parents would maybe understand that it's very difficult sometimes to move past things, even though one student may be understanding it, but the rest of the class still needs a little bit more time is a big challenge, especially in the younger grades, because we do go at a slower pace rather than a high school teacher or, you know, even primary and intermediate divisions where we're very paced and appropriate that you have to use your professional judgment on when to move on from a topic. So I think that understanding would be make my job a little bit easier. And what was the second part of that question? The second part, hold on, let me pull it up here. Um, what is one thing that would make life a little easier for you? Yeah, so that, that, was, that was the answer. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, and then we're gonna go to this question from Jody. So um, she said, this question is for those who teach tween, and teens, um, social media plays a huge part in kids' lives these days. Um, what advice do you have for parents on um, kind of when to call the limit, monitor and educate their kids on the dangers and issues that can arise from social media? Um, and how do you see it playing a positive role in education without it being detrimental to their mental health? So I think, um, I know Kayla, you teach from, like you said, the youngest to the oldest of, um, the the students in the school board so i'm going to kind of direct this to you um do you have any kind of advice for the parents about social media because i know you cover a lot of different age groups i think it's a i think it's a tough call um i don't think there's a right or wrong answer on how you can address this um, because i think every student every age is so different um, and their personalities so i have i mean i've come across um, even some of the kids that I've coached, who I know a lot, a lot, uh, a lot more on a personal level versus, you know, just being in an everyday classroom. And some of them can go without being on their phone and some of them are glued. Um, so I think it's, it's very hard um, 
it's a hard thing to monitor. I mean, even in the classroom, you have, I've got students who beg to go on their phone, um, you know, especially the grade sevens and eights. And it's always, you know, well, I just want to listen to music when I'm teaching. Um, and something that I personally do is when I have people begging for that, and I know it's not a rule that's enforced by their classroom teacher, I always carry my speaker with me and I say, I'll, I'll put on requests for you guys while you're while you're working as that happy medium. So they're not getting stuck on their phones. Um, and it's actually worked really well for me um, in the classroom. Um, I think as well, I mean, I know we've all been very privileged in going to UIT and, and going through teachers college with the emphasis on technology. Um, however, just from friends of mine who didn't go to UIT, didn't have that much of an emphasis on uh, technology in their teaching practice. And I think, um, you know, as teachers, if we can find a way to bring technology into the classroom and educate and, and pretty much change behaviors around using technology, that will also help at home. Um, I, I find a lot still in classrooms, we're in that half kind of half mode where it's like, we're, we're just doing handouts and we're just doing photocopies and this is what we're doing and we're staying away from technology and just kind of what Fabio said, it's just we're we're, we're, we're having being forced to use technology. And unfortunately, not every single classroom has tablets for everybody. Not everybody has um, technology accessible to them, depending on what school that they're at. So that also poses a challenge. But I find if, you know, if schools can start to open up to having um, technology accessible to every student and being able to change those behaviors could also potentially help in the home setting um, as well. Um, and I, and I mean, I just noticed as well, just from the kids that I coach is just them being busy outside of school, um, keeps them off their devices a little bit more and how you engage them as a, as a parent, again, just differentiates on the individual. So, I mean, I'm kind of hoping that the more that, you know, technology is implemented in the schools and accessible that it could potentially hopefully change the behaviors of, of kids um, because they're just so glued to it. It's, it's instant gratification and I find that the moment that they do have an activity that's on an iPad, it's like dead silence. They're so engaged. Um, and I, I think there was one day, um, oh gosh, it's losing it from the top of my head, goes into the coding piece that Allison was talking about. Um, and just knowing that they can use technology for all the right reasons and learning um, all these types of things. There's a Google code day that they did um, and they were so pumped. Um, not one single complaint um, about, oh, I want music or I'm going on. I didn't catch a single student on um, on playing a video game, trying to sneak on to YouTube or, or whatever it was. So I think, again, it's just it's just how can we use it in a positive way um, and highlighting those positive things with technology and not always just focusing on it as the negative, because really everywhere we look, we are surrounded by technology. So how can we put that in a positive manner um, and just changing that mindset around that? Awesome. And I know Allison had um, something quick she wanted to say as well in regards to this question. So Allison. The big thing I can tell parents in terms of access to technology is just a, is um, trying to get your, your child to learn to moderate themselves. So when is it okay and when is it not okay to, to do their own personal things, right? Um, at the high school level, you have no choice because every kid has a cell phone. Um, but just teaching them when it's okay and when it's not okay to use their device, that makes the biggest difference. So just learning that the fact that yes, you can leave your phone face down on your desk in front of you and just listen for the next 15 minutes, you're not gonna die. Nothing's gonna, the world's not gonna end, right? But just learning to moderate and learning to, like Kayla said, like some of these students are glued. So just learning to put it down for 15 minutes and ignore it and, and just have that distance because it makes all the difference in the world when they can learn because technology is always going to be there. They're going to have it as an adult. So you got to learn at some point learn to when to put it away. Awesome. Okay. And um, we just kind of have one last question here. It's actually from myself. Um, so I know that um, Carolyn mentioned I just finished my commerce degree and now I am heading into my first year of teacher's college at Ontario Tech 2. Um, I'm in primary junior. And then I'm also heading into my last or like my senior season of um, hockey. So it's kind of my last go around, I guess, of living the dream out here. Um, so I guess just my question is any advice for me as I kind of head into um, the high of my last season? Um, fingers crossed. I know they're hoping to get one, but it's not confirmed until it happens at this point. Um, so any advice for me in that? And then um, just 
dealing with like first year teachers college and, and juggling everything. So I'd love some, some input. Uh, I think enjoy it <laughs> is probably the best advice I can give you. Enjoy that last season of your respective sport because then you'll end up finding yourself like me. Oh, when I, or, you know, I used to, right. And then I have my brother making fun of me that, you know, I'm not in shape anymore. I still can't play. And, you know, so really enjoy it. Um, take every day, you know, and with a full stride and really enjoy your time there because you'll end up looking back and thinking, wow, time fly. Um, I spent three years at Ontario Tech and they went by so quickly because I really enjoyed my time. I was around great people and the Ontario Tech um, faculty of ed downtown um, was like a little secluded place downtown. And there wasn't really much classes around it. So I really built really good connections with other people around campus, not just my teammates. And I think that was a positive. You meet new people and you connect. And I think the best advice I can give you is just enjoy it and um, get out of your comfort zone. As teachers, I think we face different challenges every day and it's okay to you know, make mistakes or say, okay, this didn't work, but I'll adapt and maybe try something else tomorrow. And I think that's the best piece of advice. You're never gonna perfect teaching. I don't think anybody will ever say, I'm the perfect teacher and there's nothing more I could have done. So mm -hmm. just be open-minded and always try and consistently improve. Yeah, I know. I remember um, coming in as a first year and all the fifth years and fourth years were like, like it goes by so fast, blah, blah. And I remember we're all like first years and we're like, oh my God, like whatever. And now I'm like, just finished fourth year and I'm like, oh my God, it goes by so fast. And now I'm like, I get what you were saying. But sorry, I saw Kayla had advice for me, I think. Uh, no, I was just going to say like, uh, so, you know, with teachers college, I mean, I was in the last one year program, so I kind of escaped the, the two year, <laughs> year program, but, um, I would just say when you are on placement, um, and you do get that in classroom experience, you know, just don't be afraid to try things. Uh, don't be afraid to do something different that somebody hasn't done before. Um, and take those opportunities to really learn um, from your teaching partner um, and ask them lots of questions and take lots of notes. And, you know, even if it's the littlest thing, because then down the road, you'll be like, oh, what's that game that she did or he did? And it's just like, I need that because, you know, even as a supply, if that's how you end up starting out or, or if you get a classroom right away, you're going to want those little things and just mm -hmm. scrambling for them when you are starting your own classroom. Um, is always a lot of work in the beginning. Correct me if I'm wrong, friends, but like, um, um, but yeah, just just experiment, have fun, and just don't be afraid, um, and really take those placements and just, you know, just totally soak yourself in and, and learn as much as possible and pick those those teachers' brains, even if it's not just your own teacher, but even in the staff room, um, can you learn from those teachers? Um, you know, even if that means you can help out with one of the sports teams or, you know, book club or whatever it might be just to learn or even just um, doesn't mean you have to be running something, but just to observe, sit on the side and take notes and just say, wow, this is actually a great idea. How could you change this? What could you add? Um, what do you really like? And how could you even bring that into your own classroom? So I would just say, use those opportunities. Um, you know, even when you don't think it's important, there is something that's always happening that you could benefit from. So that's what I would just say for sure. Awesome. I, was, I was also going to add, collect as many resources as you can. Every handout, make a photocopy of it. Ask your teachers if they'll share your, their files with you because as many resources as you can collect just adds to the pile of options that you have, especially okay. because you're going to be teaching all different levels, um, especially the supply level, right? So you could get thrown into any situation and any resources at least get you a little bit of a starting point. So don't be afraid to ask. Every teacher is honestly happy to share what they have with you. It might not be the most organized, but at least it's something that you can go through and adapt for yourself. Awesome, thank you. And I think Carolyn's ready to wrap it up here. I am, I could very happily listen to this all night long, if only just to watch Fabio and Chris smack talk each other in the Q and A. Um, I love that. <laughs> So on behalf of the Alumni Association and the Ontario Tech Bridgebacks, uh, the, our alumni, future alumni at this event, I really want to thank all of you for sharing your insights and experiences this evening. 
Um, we have a thank you gift of some of the new alumni swag coming your way. I know a couple of you said UOIT tonight. We got to get you guys saying Ontario Tech. Uh, Marissa, thank you so much. You did an amazing job this evening, and we wish you the best of luck as you head off into the Bachelor of Education this fall. Thank you for having me, and thanks oh, for all your right. advice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the important part of this evening, um, as you see on the screen, ho hopefully what you're seeing on the screen here, um, you have an opportunity to win one of two great prizes this evening. Uh, you will be receiving a post-event survey. Um, we'd love to hear about who you'd love to hear, sorry, we'd love to hear about who you'd uh, like to see featured in an upcoming event. Um, so you'll be able to either fill this out, uh, it should be pop up in your browser if you're on a laptop. This will also be coming out in a post event email as well that you'll receive tomorrow night. Make sure you fill it out, confirm your email, and that will be your chance to win either this amazing hoodie from uh, courtesy of the Ridgebacks or this fantastic country puzzle courtesy of the Alumni Association Council. Uh, again, tonight's event was brought to you by the Ridgebacks and the Alumni Association Council. Uh, our next event coming up is going to be our Council AGM, which is going to be on June the 12th. We are very excited to welcome Dr. Nahid Dasani, class of 2008, uh, who will be providing the keynote address. Um, registration will be up on alumni.ontariotechu.ca. Um, stay tuned for that. There will be an official announcement coming out as soon as that opens. Again, thank you everyone. So, uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And uh, I looks like Fabio's got one last thing he wants to say there. Yes, I forgot one thing. I just wanna give a quick shout out to Chris Cameron. Okay, um, great friend of mine at uh, Ontario Tech. And I think I wouldn't have uh, made him quite happy if I didn't give him a shout out, okay? <laughs> Absolutely, I forgot you had that note there. So yes, big shout out to Chris Cameron. Uh, and uh, yeah, all right. So again, keep an eye out for that survey and we'll be announcing prize winners. And uh, yes, I hope everybody has a lovely evening. Thank you so much. Take care and stay well. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.